today and to be in God's house and to have an opportunity to listen to his word today. And I believe God's word is supernatural and God's word does change us. And uh, I pray that God will do some great things in our heart and mind today. I've entitled the message, Zik Lag, Rebound and Recovery During Devastation. Everyone has gone through times of devastation, and if you will do me a favor and open up to the book of 1 Samuel, the 30th chapter, 1 Samuel, the 30th chapter, we're not going to read all 19 verses, but we are going to read verses 1 through 6, and I'd ask you to do me a favor and stand in respect and in honor of the Word of God today as we read 1 Samuel 30, verses 1 to 6. Could you stand with me? In respect to the Word of God, as we read it together, verses 1 through 6, it says, Now it happened, when David and his men came to Ziklag, on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, attacked Ziklag, and burned it with fire and had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept, until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Father, Please bless your word today. Hide me behind the cross, Lord. We certainly want to hear from you. And Lord, we know that your word does never return void, but it always accomplishes your purpose and pleasure. And even in a small group this morning, Father, you have a great purpose and a great pleasure for these dear folks. So please give us victory. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated, folks. When I say the word devastation, I'm sure you all have things that come to mind. We have all gone through devastating times, and what might devastate you might not be something that devastates me, but if we were even to look back through history, we have seen a lot of devastating things take place, and they are mounting up and getting more and more frequent in the world that we live in. I've listed a couple of things. We've all heard of the Holocaust. Certainly that was devastating. We've heard of so many catastrophic events. We've heard of tsunamis that have devastated people and wiped people from their homes and devastated families. The Twin Towers... 9-11, lost jetliners that were never seen or heard from again, daughters in a girl's school who were kidnapped and sold into a sex trafficking endeavor by terrorist activity. Over and over again, so many devastating things, but most of those devastations will never occur, will never happen to us. I believe by God's grace, if those things did happen, God would give us the grace to be able to pass through those things. But some of the things that we go through that are devastating, the loss of a loved one, maybe a loss of income, a job, fearing bills, fearing losing our homes, maybe health issues. Maybe someone in your life who suddenly has a deadly disease or has something that's infectious or somebody who has an addiction and they're unable to have victory in that. Maybe it's a relational devastation, someone who once loved you, never loving you again, or leaving your side. 
and not being faithful. Maybe it's our sons, maybe it's our daughters that our heart breaks for because when they hurt and when they make wrong decisions, it breaks our heart. And it causes us to grieve for them, not only our children, but all of the young people around us that we care about. There is devastation. One writer has made a statement about Satan. Satan is behind every zik lag. If you look at what David endured, if you look at what David met up with when he returned to this little town, Satan is behind all of the zik lags in our life. And he went on to say this, Satan plunders our joy. He robs us of our victory. He seeks to spoil the generations that come after us. He has pillaged our prayers and he has mocked our worship. He has looted our peace. It's no wonder that one of his names in the word of God is destroyer. If you don't realize it today, Satan hates your guts because of simply embracing the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he hates and whom he seeks to thwart his every purpose. See, God has a purpose for you. God has joy. God has something he wants you and me to accomplish. The Bible says he pulled us up out of a horrible pit. He set our feet on a rock. And he has established our goings. God is actually monitoring where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. And he wants to be intimately involved in that entire process. Dick. Excuse me, David, as you know, was on the run. He was running from King Saul. He had already been anointed king by Samuel. He was the rightful heir to the throne, but he respected Saul. So he fled from him. Saul was jealous because so many praised David. So many wrote songs about David and his accomplishments. And Saul became a green-eyed monster and sought to hunt David down to kill him. We find in this portion of Scripture, David with 600 soldiers who were faithful to him, who had turned their back on Saul, we find that they are battling up in a place called Aphek we find that Aphek is three days away from Ziklag. And while they're in Aphek, the Amalekites, an enemy of all Israel, is in Ziklag wreaking havoc, burning down their houses, stealing their possessions, taking their daughters and their sons and their wives away. Now, this may sound strange, but sometimes when you lose people and they're utterly lost or they're killed, in some ways there's closure, even though that's heartbreaking. But these 600 men knew that their wives, their sons, their daughters had been carried off, and they probably would never see them again. You see, back in 1 Samuel 15, Saul was commanded by God to utterly destroy the Amalekites. But he did not obey. And he did not ultimately destroy them. And now, sowing and reaping, they are wreaking the havoc of the Amalekites still being on the scene. So David comes back to Ziklag. Does everybody have a place where you like to go? A peaceful place? An enjoyable place? Maybe it's the backyard. Maybe it's sitting by a lake. Maybe it's in the woods walking a trail. Maybe it's simply going to an old town and walking up and down the streets and you get a sense of peace from that. Have you ever said, I just want peace? I just need peace in my life. I just need all of the adversity and all of the struggles to end. Ziklag was that for David. 
David set up this little place for his 600 soldiers and their families, and it was an oasis. It was a place to rest, a place to go to after they had battled. And now they arrive back after battling in Aphek. What do they see? They see their homes have been burned. They see their possessions have been stolen. They see that their families have been kidnapped. Total devastation. Can you personalize and imagine it being your home, being your family, and being in this situation, the situation that David was in? He had no control. What could he do? He was totally helpless. He was the king, even though he was not sitting on the throne yet. And he was leading a group of people that he felt responsible for. He had lost also, but he was responsible for them, for their feelings, for them to be encouraged, for their things and families to be restored. Total devastation. Ever been there? Out of control? What am I going to do now? I feel so helpless. I feel so alone. Where are you, God? Are you going to help me? Are you going to work this out for me? We're going to notice some things about Ziklag, and maybe when you hear Ziklag, you'll probably never hear it again unless you read the Word of God. But when you think of Ziklag, think of what God can do in the midst of devastation. When you're broken, when you're hurting, when life does not seem possible, when you don't feel like you can continue or go on, when you don't understand your circumstances, when people turn on you, when you almost come to the place of not wanting to live. Remember Job? He cursed the day that he was born because of devastating times. Let's look at some things concerning devastation. The first thing this morning, notice the shock of devastation. Have you ever been in shock? Have you ever had something happen that was so traumatic to you, couldn't even talk? You were just in shock, you were speechless, you were petrified, and the words would not come to your lips. Read with me verses 1 to 3 once again as we look at the condition because I want it to be on your mind and heart this morning. Now it happened. When David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire, and had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, their daughters had been taken captive. David had two wives. They were gone. Six hundred men. Where's my sons? Where's my daughters? Where's my wife? They're gone. They've been taken and they're devastated. Verse 4, David and his men mourn the raid at Ziklag. They mourn. In fact, it goes on to say, a little further down, in verse 4, look at what it says, David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Have you ever cried that much? Have you ever cried that long? Have you ever been that broken where you don't even have the strength to grieve anymore? That's where David was. Total devastation. And you know what? These times come up in our lives. If you want to turn with me to Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, I want to read some verses to you. It's called the seasons of life. We go through different things, don't we? And we need God every step of the way. It says to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. And then a series of things. A time to be born, a time to die. A time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up. 
a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace, various seasons in our life. Some of them are not so good. Some of them are devastating. Some of them cause us to be in a state of shock. But be encouraged. We have a great God. We have a God who tells us things like this in Galatians 6, 9. Be not weary in well-doing. For in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Hebrews 4.15, talking about Jesus, our high priest, says, For we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. What did Jesus go through? Hated? Abandoned? Betrayed? Beaten? An innocent sacrifice named the Lamb of God who did everything He did for us? Total devastation. Don't ever say God doesn't understand what I'm going through. God doesn't feel it. God doesn't know. He was 100% human and 100% Almighty God. A shock of devastation. And most of the time, our world doesn't know how to advance beyond that. We have a Savior. We have the Son of God. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. We have hope. We have power. We have answers to all of life's difficulties and devastation. So secondly, notice the emotional side of devastation. Verse 6, Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. I don't understand. Was this David's fault? He comes back. He is in the same situation as they are. He has lost loved ones. His home has been burned. His possession has been taken along with 600 other warriors who lost their families and they turn towards Him who they have been faithful to. These are David's mighty men. Anybody can turn on you when they're devastated. They're devastated. They've turned their back on Saul. They're on the run along with David. They've loved him. They believe him to be king. Now they want to stone him. Now they want to pick up rocks and kill the anointed king. How do you think David felt as he's leading these band of men? As he's already running from Saul? As he's missing Jonathan? And very soon in the future, Saul and Jonathan would lose their lives. So he'd lose his dearest of friends. He hadn't even had that occur yet. Total devastation, and now everyone's turning on them. What would you do? What do we do? We blame. We deny. We self-medicate to kill the pain. We numb ourselves. We get involved in wrong relationships. And endless, empty pursuits, we try to fix it. But I'm giving you a message on devastation and on a man who was after God's own heart. So David did the right thing. So they blame him. He has to carry his own pain in theirs. Pain and grief comes in clusters. Have you ever noticed that? Seems to me everything that happens in my life, it comes three and fourfold. I can go through a season like Ecclesiastes 3 where everything's good for a month. Everything's fine. And then all of a sudden, something bad happens. And then the phone rings. And then there's something in the mail. 
and then somebody pulls me aside at church or a family member says something, and all of a sudden you've got five or six things that you're dealing with. A cluster. Why is that? Why does that take place? Anybody here ever watch, if if you're young, your parents might not let you, ever watch UFC, Ultimate Fighting? Ever see those guys in the octagon fighting and beating on each other? It's not boxing. Boxing, when you punch and knock somebody down, the referee gets in between. He does a 10 count if somebody's fallen down. He gives you a chance to recover. With the UFC, if one fighter knocks the other fighter down, he immediately leaps on him on the ground and starts punching him out for all he's worth. He doesn't give him a moment to regain his strength. Don't you know Satan's that way? When you fall down, he doesn't say, Oh, I'm sorry, buddy. You get up, catch your breath. I'm sorry. No, when he gets you down, his foot immediately goes to step on your neck. He hates you. And he wants to devastate your life. And if you're a born-again Christian, you'll never lose your salvation. But he'll seek to rob you of your testimony by poor choices that we might make when we are devastated. So Satan is coming full force at David. They blame David. Why are things so explosive at this point? What did David do? You know, 2 Corinthians 2, verses 10 and 11 talks about when we fail to forgive people. It says, when we fail to forgive people, Satan gains an advantage on us. And it says, we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. I think Paul wasn't ignorant of Satan's devices, but I think sometimes we are. Satan gets his foot in the door and he schemes and he plans. Bad things happen. Emotions, devices that Satan uses. Here's some of the things we do, and I mentioned some already. Poor decisions. Impulsive moves. When you're devastated, do you ever just go do something dumb? Many times we do. Denial. Self-medicate, as I mentioned. Try to escape. Blame. But David did not do that. The third thing, the cure for devastation. Strengthening ourselves in the Lord. How do you do that? How do you strengthen yourself in the Lord? We're watching a series on Wednesday night by Andy Stanley, and I don't really care what people's viewpoint is on Andy Stanley. I've got a pastor friend who loves the study and wants to teach it, but he's got people in his church that just can't stand Andy Stanley. You know, separate the meat from the bone. It's the Word of God he's teaching. You know, you big babies. Seriously. You know, seriously. You know, so many things we could learn from. And we're like, oh. Did you hear that one word he said? You know, get over it. Andy Stanley talks about following. And he says, we need to be true followers. Not Christian consumers. What we do, folks, and I'm not afraid to say this. It might sound a little hard today. We keep God in our pocket. And when we need a little God, we pull him out. He's almost like a spiritual CVS store. I'm having a little spiritual headache. I need a little God. My stomach is a little upset, spiritually speaking. I need a little God. You know, it's not Pepto-Bismol. It's a little bit of Jesus that we need in our life. And we only pull Him out when we need Him. But we're not a true follower. Every day, loving Him and in devotion to Him and committing our life to Him. We need to put the things he loves as number one in our life. Church attendance. He died for this thing. People who are represented by these seats. I told people Wednesday night, because I got them scared. I was getting a little excited about this stuff. I said, folks, guess what? This is going to blow you away. I believe in vacations. Right? I believe everybody takes a vacation. Pastor Gary will never roll his eyes and say, where are you going? You've got to be kidding. You're going to enjoy yourself? An island? Do you really need an island? You're going again? I used 
the battle for people in my last church because they didn't have enough money to go on a good vacation. So they go two or three times during the year for two days each time. And it happened to take in Sunday because they worked. Leave them alone. Folks, I am talking about... It's funny that you amen on that one. <laughs> I'm talking about folks that you don't see for a month and they're not on vacation. Somebody who has a head cold and they're not in church, but they're at work. I'm sorry. My Savior died for me. If it was raining, he would have died. If he had a headache, he would have died. If he had some sort of incurable disease, he would have died. He loved us. And he gave it all. If we want to be moved from devastation to blessings, we have to be a true follower. We cannot be a Christian consumer where we pull Jesus out whenever it's convenient. I happen to be one of those nut jobs that when the doors of the church are open, we ought to be there. Amen? That'd be a good one to amen. amen. We have the Lord's Supper. We ought to say, oh my goodness, we're looking back to what Jesus did for me? I'm going to be there. We're looking forward to Him coming again? Hey, listen, this one called Jesus we're talking about, we're going to spend all eternity with Him. We better get used to being with Him and worshiping and being where He wants us to be so that we can reach other for this world. Be a true follower. The Quakers, their tradition calls this centering down, seeking to enter a calm, quiet, reflective, receptive state when we strengthen ourselves in the Lord. Settling down, getting close to Jesus, getting close to God, looking for direction, looking for comfort. I can't get my answers anywhere else but from God. Some other things that I think are extremely powerful, James 4.10, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. How about Colossians 1.18? In all things He should have the preeminence. That means number one. That means He's the boss. That means he's chief. He's in control. David also knew how to encourage himself in the Lord. You know, he wrote most of the Psalms. You know, he played music. He played his harp to the Lord and meditated on the things of God. That's why he was a man after God's own heart. Let me read you a couple of Psalms. Psalm 18, the first part of verse 6. He said, in my distress, I call upon the Lord. Again, think about what we do when we're in distress. Call upon the Lord. Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Everybody know the 23rd Psalm? I'm not going to quote it all by memory, but some phrases. He causes us to lie down in green pastures. By still waters. He restores our soul. He leads us in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. Thou anointest my head with oil. He says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Calm waters... Restoring our soul. Remember David when he sinned? He said in Psalm 51, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. You see, only God can do that. Psalm 62, verses 1 and 2 says, Truly my soul silently waits for God. From Him comes my salvation. The final thing this morning, folks. Notice God's plan beyond devastation. Verses 8 and 9 and 10. It says, David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. So David went, he and the 600 men who were with him and came to the brook Bezar, where those stayed who were left behind. But David pursued, he and 400 men. 200 couldn't handle it. They were tired. The 200 were so weary that they could not cross the brook Bezor. 
And it goes on to talk about them battling for a long time to regain their families and their possessions. Listen, when I have devastation in my life, I kind of run. I can find out why they did that. You know, and I end up worse off than I do that. David has lost his family. David has 600 men that are like this with rocks in their hands, wanting to stone him and blame him. He's lost his family. He, you would think, being the warrior that he was, that he'd just take off after the Amalekites. But he stops. He walks over. He probably kneels. He says, Lord, should I go after them? Is that a dumb question? No. He said, you know what? This happened for a reason, and I want to make sure I'm in tune with God. I want to make sure that things don't go from bad to worse. You ever have that happen? Devastation, and you decide to fix it, and it gets worse. You know, what do we say, the old saying, from the frying pan into the fire? Right? David says, Lord, should I go? God says, go. You'll recover all. I will be with you. So upon that, David takes off with his 600 men. They come to a brook. 200 are extremely tired from battling at Aphek. They're emotionally distraught. Remember, they could not weep anymore. So he pursues after them and pulls down their strongholds, and he gets back everything that was lost. I want to close by saying something very important. And I know it's warm in here. I understand that. I'm a little bit warm myself. But uh, this is important, and I hope you take this home with you. Devastation needs to be replaced with godly endeavors. You all hear that? When you're devastated, if you do your own thing and run in your own direction and come up with your own remedy, you're going to be in trouble. Devastation needs to be replaced with godly endeavors. I just want to tell you about a verse in Scripture. We looked at it Wednesday night. Matthew 12, 43 to 45. It's speaking about when Christ or a follower of Christ exercised a demon from an individual. Pretty serious stuff. Exercising a demon from an individual. It says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man... And I'm going to paraphrase. Here's what happens. The unclean spirit is taken out of a man by the Lord or one of his followers, and the unclean spirit leaves. And he's kind of floating around, looking for a home, looking for another place to abide in. And while he's floating around, he gathers some other demonic spirit. So now maybe there's five or ten or fifteen demonic spirits floating around. In the meantime, if the guy who initially had the demon exercised out of his life does not fill himself with something godly, and he remains an empty vessel, the one initial demon will come back with the ten others and go right back into the individual where they started, and the end will be worse than the beginning. I hope you know where I'm coming from. That when we're devastated, we need the Lord. When we're devastated, we need to take the devastation, or the emotional stress, or the addiction, or whatever it is, replace it with something godly. Because if you don't, you will end up worse than you began. And we have seen people in life, haven't you? The more they reject the things of God, the worse they get. We met a guy at Keswick. He was back for his third time, Tom in the kitchen, Nathan. And he said to us, this is my third time back. He said, finally, here's the word, I surrender. Why not the first time? You know, maybe he thought Kendrick was a magic place. He'd walk in and, and he'd be all set. He found out it wasn't a magic place. It was his heart that needed to be changed. So the third time he said, I'm surrendered this time. 
What if we don't get a fourth time? Make sure that devastation is replaced with godly pursuits. A question as we close today. What's your ziklag? What is the thing that devastates you? Well, I don't like to think about it. I don't think about it anymore. I put that one to bed. It's still there. You still need God's grace and his power and to replace it for something else. Maybe it's a son. Maybe it's a daughter. Maybe it's a sickness. Maybe it's not being accepted by a certain family member. Maybe you're living in a zip lag right now. You know how to encourage yourself in the Lord. You know how to replace your devastation in the job of the Spirit. This will not make it possible. You don't understand how to do it, but you will not listen to the Lord. You don't have the joy of the Lord. Why would you? Why would you throw over the life of our Lord? Because we're not totally thrilled about our God. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I don't know if you know this, and I know pastors say these things, but I love you. I loved you as I was preparing to come. I didn't even know you. That's called having a pastor's heart. If a pastor doesn't have a pastor's heart, look out. I want us to grow, but I want you, first off, to be joyful and know how to deal with life. I want our kids to know how to deal with life. I want our kids to put Jesus first, to put his house first, so they can teach their kids one day. I want us to know how great God is and how much he loves us. Maybe you're here today and you might say, Pastor Gara, I've got some ziklags in my life. might only be emotional at this point. It might be over with. But you have a ziklag. You have some devastation, and you say, Pastor Garrett, keep me in prayer this morning. Anybody like that? I see your hand, buddy. I see your hand. I see your hand. Somebody else. I've got some dick life. I've got some things that have devastated me. Maybe you replaced them with the wrong thing. Not something godly, and it's even worse now. Maybe you self-image. Maybe who you are as a person is all messed up because you didn't replace devastation with something godly. Won't you do it this morning? Right where you're sitting, pray something like this, Lord God, help me to seek you out first when I'm devastated. Help me to put you first in my life. Forgive me of my sin. Help me to stop doing things my way and to yield to your power. I need your supernatural hand in my life. I want to be like David. He made mistakes, but he was a man after God's own heart. I'm just going to wait a moment. Maybe you'd like to come forward and kneel at the step there, at the altar, somewhere else. I've got a zig flag, Pastor Gary, and I just want to pray. I don't want to do things my way. Even when things get good, I don't want to forget that I need God. I want to help others. Those who receive grace, give grace. We get all caught up in our own lives. Are you a true follower or a Christian consumer? I need to get things right with God. Maybe write in your seat. Maybe rededicate your life to Him. Father, we thank You that You hear our prayers. We thank You, Father, that You understand what it is to be devastated. You understand what it is, Lord God, to be heartbroken. And Lord, we know that only you can lift us up out of the ashes. Only you can make things right. Only you can breathe on a lifeless situation like you breathed on the dry bones in the book of Ezekiel. 
and cause something to live that was dead. Might we never give up, Lord, because there's always hope with You. You're on Your throne. You're all-powerful. And we love You. And we want to love You the way that You deserve to be loved. Bless now, we pray. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.